Well, when we were at the lake last month, uh, one night I stayed up late with my Bible and went through the book of First John and, and just kind of broke it down into 25 potential sermons. And uh, I took that list home with me and, uh, you know, looked at it a few times and have kind of gotten fired up about, about the wonderful truth that's there in the book of First John. And uh, so if the Lord wills, that'll be our plan uh, for the remainder of the year to, uh, to work our way through this first letter of the Apostle John. Uh, so feel free to open your Bibles there if you'd like to the first chapter of the first epistle of John. John was an old man by the time he wrote these words. Um, he's probably the only apostle still alive. The others had all been martyred uh, for their faith. Uh, tradition says that John at this time was a pastor at the church in Ephesus. And that he was probably writing this letter to the surrounding churches there in Asia Minor that he was helping to kind of oversee as an apostle. And those churches were in trouble. Those churches were under attack. They were under attack from the outside. Uh, under attack from worldliness and idolatry and outright persecution coming at them in various ways. But it seems like they were in even greater danger from the inside. That there were, there were a bunch of false teachers that were really troubling those churches. False teachers that had brought in destructive errors and heresy. And, and particularly it seems like this heresy known as Gnosticism uh, was a problem that John is trying to combat. Uh, Gnosticism... And these other errors were dishonoring Christ, undermining the gospel, uh, causing trouble in the churches, um, and leading some into outright apostasy. So in the midst of the trouble and confusion of those times, here this, the aged apostle writes this bold little letter to send out to the churches to try to put things right, to try to hold up truth and encourage people to hold fast that truth of the things of God. Now, John is often portrayed in, say, religious artwork as being kind of a girly guy, uh, being kind of dreamy and soft and weak and whatever. I think that's totally wrong. That is not the John we see in the Bible. He was a tough dude. And I mean, he was a blue collar guy, right? I mean, he's a fisherman in the family business when Jesus calls him. He and his brother, Jesus gave the, gave the nickname. You remember the nickname? The Sons of Thunder. I mean, you don't get a nickname like that being some kind of wimp, right? Um, he and his brother, they were the ones that wanted to call down fire from heaven on that unbelieving Samaritan village. These are aggressive guys. Um, and they're bold, audacious guys. Remember, they get their mom to go talk to Jesus about making the two of them the top guys in Jesus' kingdom. That's pretty bold stuff. And, and here we see John as an old man. He's not lost any of that boldness, that intensity. He's not, he's not bold about himself. He's passionate about what? He's passionate about the gospel. He's passionate about the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and it, it's like he's, he's this grizzled old warrior <laughs> towards the end of his life who is still contending earnestly for the faith He's, he's like a veteran pastor who's trying to protect all these precious sheep out there from the wolves that are circling around them. And he writes this letter to try to help in all that. I, I think if there's one word that could summarize the book of 1 John, it would be the word certainty. Certainty. John wants these believers to be certain. To be sure. To be confident to know exactly where they stand without any question 
about certain great big truths. And so, and so John, as he communicates these things, he writes in kind of an absolute style. <laughs> he, 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 there's, not, there's, not thing, there's not much nuance. I mean, things are stark and bare when he talks about them. Um, it, it, there's, a sense, there's a sense that he feels that the times are so urgent that he just can't mess around with nuance. He can't, mess, he can't go around and round off all the sharp edges for everybody. And he's just going to lay it out there. Just as strong as he can. In the hopes that the message will get through to the people that need it. John seems to sort out everybody into two and only two categories. Things are very simple in his mind. Either you're alive or you're dead. Either you're in the light or you're in the darkness. Either you're holy or you're a sinner. Either you are a son of God or a child of the devil. You either have the spirit of truth or the spirit of error. You either love people or you hate people. You belong to the world or you belong to Christ. And so there's all these strong statements in the book of John that kind of bug us. And, and our, 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 our impulse is to, is to jump in there and kind of try to soften things up. Well, it doesn't really mean that. It doesn't really mean that. Um, but let's resist that impulse a little bit. We need this book just as it was written. In all the bold clarity that is here. I think we need the book of 1 John more now than ever in my lifetime. See, we live in a time similar to John's time. Think about it. Think about what's going on right today. We see great confusion out there about really basic stuff. We see in the church a casual lukewarmness on the one hand. We see a creeping unbelief on the other hand. We see shocking apostasies happening in all directions. So much false teaching being accepted and promoted by people who claim to believe the Bible. It's like the lines which in past years were pretty clear have gotten kind of shifty and blurry in recent decades. And so into this situation comes the Apostle John with a big black sharpie marker. And he says, you guys need some lines. I'll draw some lines for you. Just like that. He says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to show you the things you need to be absolutely certain about. Here's the big stuff where you must have clarity. And it starts with certainty about Christ and the gospel. That's what we'll talk about today. That's where he starts the letter. But then he goes on to certainty about other things. Certainty about holiness. He says in chapter 3, no one who is born of God practices sin because his seed abides in him and he cannot sin because he's born of God. How about certainty about love? He says we know we've passed from death into life because we love the brethren. He who does not love abides in death. Certainty about truth. Chapter 4, by this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Certainty about the world and the devil. What's going on out there? John says the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. That's what's going on. Certainty about whether you are a real Christian or a fake Christian. A lot about that in this letter. At the, at the end of the letter, John says in, in, in chapter 5, verse 13, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know. So you may know what? You may know that you have eternal life. He wants you to be sure that you have eternal life. If you're saved, John wants you to be sure about being saved. He wants you to have assurance. But if you're not saved, if you're a false Christian, he wants you to see that as well. He wants you to be clear. He wants you to be certain about where you stand. Now, one thing you immediately notice when you, when you study John's letter is that his writing style is completely different than 
most of the rest of the New Testament. I mean, Paul and Luke wrote most of the uh, pages of the New Testament. John would come in third in the number of pages. Uh, but, but, but Paul and Luke, they write in a, in a way that is linear, that is kind of step-by-step step and logical. They're easy to follow where they're going. It's kind of all in a straight line. But John is not like that. John writes sort of in tangled loops and twists and turns, and he, he'll, he'll, he'll talk about something, and then he'll revert back to it later and talk about it again and say it in a little different way. It's a different style. It sometimes feels like John needed an editor for his letter. And yet, the interesting thing is the Lord preserved this letter for us in our Bibles just the way it is. And I think that in itself is instructive uh, for several reasons. I've thought about this a bunch of times. Uh, I mean, for one thing, it's a reminder that, 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 that while we say, yes, all Scripture is God-breathed, we should not have an idea of Bible inspiration like it was some mechanical process, like the Holy Spirit was, was giving a guy just word by word by word by word what to say. But rather, it's, it's a process by which the Spirit worked through the individual personality and style of that particular writer to give us God's Word and to give us a huge variety of the way truth is communicated throughout the Bible, through different people. And that's good that it's that way. I think there's also a lesson here for us in the way we try to communicate spiritual truth to others. We're all trying to do that. In some way, we're trying to communicate truth just within our own families or, or whatever, a jail service or, or up here trying to give a sermon or whatever. And that lesson is be yourself. Be yourself when you're trying to communicate truth to somebody. When you're witnessing to your best friend in a coffee shop, be yourself. When you do, don't try to copy me. Don't try to copy somebody else, some famous preacher or whatever. Be yourself when you do that. John was not the same as Paul, not the same as Luke. He was not trying to be like Moses or Isaiah or David, right? He was able to be himself. And that's what the Lord wanted. That's what the Lord preser preserved in Scripture. It's for our good that it's that way. And you should trust that the Lord made you unique and that you are able to reflect the truth of Christ in a way that is unique and special and different than anybody else can do it. Be yourself. And one more application, and that is that, that the, the variety of communication styles we see in the Bible should encourage us to receive ministry from a variety of different kinds of teachers, different preachers, different authors, right? You don't, just, you don't just hear one kind or read one kind, but we can, receive, we can receive help from people that have really different styles than us. Uh, I'm grateful for the weird preachers I have heard in my lifetime. Have some of you heard some weird preachers over the years? Many of them from southern states, I would say. <laughs> but I'm grateful for them. They've contributed something. There's guys, there's guys that could not come up with a sermon outline to save their life. And yet the Spirit of God was upon them. Right? I received from them. I was changed by them. By guys like that. And so we should not have the attitude, well, that guy is not of the same style as the kind of preacher I like, so I can't receive from him. I can't hear from him. I mean, if we do that, then we can't receive from John here. I, I don't think John preached with sermon outlines. Okay. <laughs> I think his sermons are probably tangled also. We need that uniqueness. Well, anyway, that's all just introduction. Let's turn our attention to these fantastic first verses of First John. Beginning at verse 1, what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. 
and the life was manifested, and we have seen and testify and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. What we have seen and heard we proclaim to you so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed our fellowship is with the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. John doesn't give any greeting, any salutation at the beginning of his letter like you usually see in the Bible. A man, he just dives right straight into his great passion. The great passion of his whole life. What's he talking about here in this first paragraph? What's he, what's, he, what's he diving right into at the beginning of his letter? He doesn't quite spell it out, but the answer is clear. He's, he's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. He's talking about the gospel message about him and his saving work. That's the big thing here. And that's the starting point for this whole letter, for everything else uh, in this epistle. John wants us to be absolutely certain about many things in this letter. But the first thing, the bedrock of everything else, the first thing we must be certain about is the gospel of Jesus Christ. What's true about Jesus is going to drive everything else that John has to talk about. And John, if you break down these first verses, he wants us to be absolutely certain about these five ideas, these five truths concerning this great message of the Lord Jesus Christ. The first one is that it originated in eternity. We get that in the very first words. He says, what was from the beginning and then in verse 2, he says, which was with the Father. Now you might notice that this, the beginning of John's epistle is actually quite similar to the beginning of John's gospel. And we're going to make this connection a lot of times as we go forward. That there's language in John's gospel that's similar to language in his epistle. It's the same guy. This is the way he talks. It's the way he communicates. And so what's that first verse of John's Gospel? It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. Well, here he says, what was from the beginning, which was with the Father. The point here is that the Lord Jesus Christ did not begin to exist in Mary's womb. <laughs> no, He was from the beginning, the Son of God had been with God the Father forever, as far back as any of us can imagine. Back in history, back before the world was, back before anything else was, you have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit forever, existing together in perfect love and harmony. And from eternity, long before Adam's first sin, God had already planned to create you and me and to accomplish our salvation through the Son of God coming to earth, dying on a cross, and so on. Our redemption was not some stopgap deal that God had to come up with on the fly, but something that goes back to the beginning, goes back into eternity, there has always been one grand plan of redemption for humanity. And it always centered around the eternally existing Son of God. From the beginning. But that plan that originated in eternity was then manifested in time. That's the second thought. Manifested. That's the word in verse 2. The life was manifested. At the end of the verse, it was manifested to us. Something that previously was hidden and secret has now, has now become public. It's now been brought forth. It's been put on display for all to see. That's what happened when Christ came. When He entered the human race by being born of a woman. He was being manifested. Now, 
Uh, here's how John describes it in the first, first chapter of his gospel. John 1.14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we saw his glory. Glory as of the only begotten Son. Only begotten from the Father. Full of grace and truth. He came. He was manifested. You see. Uh, a little later in, in John 1. says no one's seen God at any time. But the only begotten God. Who is in the bosom of the Father. He has explained Him. He came to manifest God to manifest this gospel message to humanity. See, we cannot begin to figure God out on our own. We can look out at creation. We can, we can understand some things about, about the God who, who created this world, his, his, his power, his wisdom, and so forth. But we can't, we can't know very much about God. We can't climb up to heaven and, and investigate God in some way. No, God had to come down to earth. He had to come down here and reveal himself. And he and God, God manifested himself in the person of his son. Yes, yes, prior to that, God had been giving us truth through the words of the prophets. But now the son of God himself takes on human flesh. He comes among us as a human being. To reveal God to us. To manifest spiritual reality in a way that had never been seen on earth before or since. And it was such a clear manifestation that the Lord Jesus could tell Philip, Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. What a claim he makes. Christ by highest heaven adored. Christ the everlasting Lord. Late in time, behold Him come, offspring of a virgin's womb, veiled in flesh the Godhead see. Hail the incarnate deity, pleased as man with men to dwell. Jesus, our Emmanuel. But how can we be sure all that really happened? Well, that's the third thing here. This was observed by witnesses. Observed by witnesses, reliable men using their senses heard and saw and touched the incarnate Son of God. And that's what John brings out here. Remember, John himself was one of Jesus' closest friends who along with the other 11 apostles, they spent three years with Jesus, going around with Him all the time. And he says in verse 1, what we have heard. See, they heard everything Jesus said, right? They heard his public teaching. They they got lots of private instruction from Jesus. Some of that's recorded in the Bible. They also heard Jesus' prayers. They, They had countless informal conversations with Jesus. Every day they are hearing divine wisdom dripping from the lips of Christ. He says, we've heard it. We've heard it. He goes on in verse 1, what we have seen, what we have seen with our eyes. That's the idea of, of just kind of noticing something as it happens. But then he goes further in the next phrase and says, what we have looked at. And that, that's the idea of a prolonged, focused examination of something. He says, we not just glanced at it, we've examined this. We've focused on the person of Christ. We've seen amazing things here. They they saw all of Jesus' miracles, right? There were a lot of them. They saw Jesus' transfiguration. They saw Jesus' crucifixion. We know John was right there in the front row when Jesus was on the cross. They saw the empty tomb. They saw the risen Christ multiple times after He was resurrected. And they watched Him ascend back into the clouds and go back to heaven. They saw it. They examined it. Now you'd think that hearing and seeing would be enough, but John here makes it even more physical, doesn't he? He says, we've also touched Him with our hands. 
this was especially important to combat that Gnostic heresy. You know, because they, that teaching was that, that actually physical matter was evil, and so therefore Jesus could not have had a real, authentic, flesh and bone human body. And John says, no. No, we touched him. We know how genuinely human he was. We were around him, bumping into him for those three years. We were hugging Jesus sometimes. We, like John, was reclining on his bosom there in the Last Supper. Says we were close to him. We touched him. And but touching Jesus was especially important after his resurrection to prove that he was alive, not just as some kind of wispy spirit, but he was alive bodily. With a, with a real life human body. And Jesus invites the apostles to do this. In Luke 24 verse 39. He says. See my hands and my feet. That it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones. As you see that I have. And so these apostles were. Were eyewitnesses and ear witnesses. And even finger witnesses. To Christ the Messiah. The Son of God. Uh, I was reminded of what the Apostle Peter you know, Peter was right alongside John going through all the same experiences. And in 2 Peter 1.16 he says, We did not follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of His majesty. Peter says, we didn't make up a bunch of stories here. He says, we're just... Eyewitnesses, we're just telling you what we saw, what we experienced when we were around the person of Christ. And these first-hand witnesses, these, this is the source of everything we have in the Bible about Jesus. It's based on the testimony of all these witnesses who were there, who saw it and heard it and touched it. That's what we have in the four Gospels. Do you trust these 12 guys? you trust them? Do you find them to be credible witnesses for what they're talking about? If they were put on the stand in a courtroom here, one by one, and they came up and they testified of what they had seen and heard and touched of gospel reality, of the life of Jesus, and you heard all 12 of them one by one testify of these things, would you believe it? Would you believe their story? Would you be convinced that was really true? How about if you knew that none of those 12 ever wavered from their story? I mean, even Judas didn't waver. I mean, he admits at the end, Jesus done nothing wrong. I betrayed innocent blood. And add Paul to the number. They never wavered from their story, even though they had nothing to gain from it and everything to lose. And in fact, they did lose all. Most of them end up getting martyred. John lives a long life, but he gets persecuted the whole way. And Revelation, you know, he's exiled to the Isle of Patmos and so on. They all suffered for Christ. They suffered for their belief in these things that they had seen and heard and touched. Now we know people do lay down their lives for really bad causes. Right? The Muslim suicide bombers. Right? That is laying down your life for a bad cause. But what people do not lay down their lives for is something they know to be a hoax. These guys believed it. They knew what they had seen and heard and touched. And here John, some 50 years later, is, is absolutely certain about Christ. Just as certain as he's ever been in his life. And he wants all the rest of us to be equally certain about the gospel about Jesus. As certain as he himself was. Do you understand this? That the foundation of the Christian message is not philosophy. It's not reasoning. It's not well putting a bunch of arguments together. The foundation of Christianity is his history. It's objective facts. It's things that have happened in time and space. Things that are testified to by many credible witnesses. Our faith is based on that. Multiple reliable 
first-hand accounts, like that of the Apostle John. And what did these apostolic witnesses do with their knowledge about Jesus? John says, we proclaimed it. We proclaimed it. We didn't keep it to ourselves, but we announced it. We publicized it. Verse 2, it says, we have seen and testify and proclaim to you the eternal life. Verse 3, what we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also. They didn't keep the good news to themselves, but Jesus had commissioned them to be his witnesses, right? Acts 1, verse 8, you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. That was their job. Not just to observe it, but to proclaim what they had observed. The Lord Jesus Christ. This word proclaimed, I think, is important. Um, it, it means that there was authority and certainty in their message. These guys were not hedging. They were not speculating. They were not tentatively suggesting some things. Well, maybe this might have happened. They were not philosophizing about things. They were announcing something. They were declaring the amazing news of what had happened before their very eyes. They were not doubting or unsure of it. The Apostle Paul says in 2 Timothy 1, I know whom I have believed, and I'm convinced that he's able to guard what I've entrusted to him. There's no uncertainty. I know it. I'm convinced of it. I'm sure. I'm certain. That's how they proclaimed the gospel. But the proclaiming process didn't stop back in the first century, did it? <laughs> Because Jesus sends all of His people with the same commission to go into all the world and make more disciples and make more disciples and make more. And how do we do that? We do it the same way the apostles did. By proclaiming the truth about the Lord Jesus. Proclaiming it the same way. We are all commissioned as proclaimers. We're all commissioned to be the ambassadors of King Jesus. It's the continuing work of His church globally and the continuing work of this little congregation right here we're part of locally. It's our commission to be proclaimers of this gospel in our generation. How did, how did you ever end up becoming a Christian anyway? How did you end up a Christian? Well, I think it's because somebody, somewhere along the line, proclaimed the gospel to you. Now, it's probably a bunch of different people. People in your family, maybe. Maybe it's people that written books and things. Maybe they contributed to that. But you've heard the gospel proclaimed to you. Uh, it's like what Romans 10 says. How will they believe in Him if they've not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? There's got to be preachers. There's got to be proclaimers out there telling about Jesus. And we can only proclaim this message effectively when we ourselves are rock solid certain about its truthfulness. Just like the apostles were. See, when we witness to lost folks, we do not approach the subject of Jesus Christ as cautious, tentative, Seekers, you know, well, maybe, maybe not, I'm not sure. But we come as those who have found. <laughs> we are finders. We're telling you what we've found, what's real, what we're certain of, what we are gladly basing our lives on. What we are absolutely sure. We are declaring things of which we are certain. The Christian can bear witness like the apostles in a sense. And say, I know the risen Lord. He's real to me. He's changed my life. I know my standing in Christ. I've proved Him countless times. He lives in me. He's a daily reality. 
to me. Let me tell you about this Jesus. That's often how it is when somebody first gets saved, isn't it? Christ all of a sudden is just gloriously real to the brand new Christian. Right? And it just overflows. And, and they want to go tell everybody about Jesus. Now they don't know many Bible verses yet. They don't know all the apologetic arguments yet. But a man, they know Jesus. And they just want to tell people about Jesus. And there's power in just that certainty of even somebody that's pretty ignorant that just knows the Lord and tells others about the Lord. Think of that, that woman at the well. <laughs> She'd been saved like 15 minutes. <laughs> and she heads into town and she, she convinces basically the whole village to come out and see Jesus. She was a powerful evangelist. She didn't know much of anything. But she says, come, come see this Jesus that's told me everything I've ever done. You see, She knew something of Christ. She was certain about that. But sadly... The confidence of a new convert can disappear later on. Somebody that used to zealously lead in gospel outreach doesn't do that anymore. Why not? Because they've lost the confidence. They've lost the certainty. They can't proclaim anything anymore. They're not sure about the gospel message, or they're not sure about the assurance of their own salvation. Things have become doubtful and hazy again. It's hard to proclaim when you're not really sure about But the apostles proclaimed it. The early church proclaimed it. And we're called to proclaim what is certain and real for ourselves. And why is this so important? Why is it so important to be certain about this message and to proclaim it everywhere. Why? Because it's a matter of life and death. That's the fifth thing. This message is what gives life, eternal life, to those who will believe it. Verse 1 says the message about Christ, it's just called the word of life. The word of life. Uh, it's not clear whether he's talking about Christ himself or the message about Christ. But it Basically, it adds up to the same thing. He's the word of life. It's about life. Verse 2, he says, We proclaim to you the eternal life. The gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is a message about life. Life. Before Adam sinned there in the garden, God warned him that if he ate that forbidden fruit... In the day that you eat of it, you shall surely what? Die! And he ate of it. And he died. We've been dying ever since. We've all been born spiritually dead in trespasses and sins. But the Lord Jesus comes to earth on a life-giving mission. In John's Gospel, it says in chapter 1, In Him was life and the life was the light of men. You know, later on in chapter 10, Jesus says, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. The next chapter at Lazarus' tomb, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me shall live, even if he dies. So it's not just that Jesus talked about the topic of life. And it's not just that Jesus could dispense life to people. Like, come up here, I'll give you a squirt of this life. But instead, what, what the Scripture reveals is that the life was actually in Him. He is the eternal life, is what John says here. Um, you get this life by being joined to the Lord Jesus Christ spiritually. It's the only way to get spiritual life. It's being joined to Jesus. Being one of His. Being saved by Him that way. When you become a Christian, new spiritual life begins in your soul. The theological word for that is regeneration. Right? It's life in you. The life of God and the soul of man. Though your body will die physically in a few years, your soul 
live forever. Your soul as a Christian, you already have eternal life. You already possess it in that sense. But, it's, but we're not done with life, are we? At the end of the world, the Lord Jesus will return. The body of every Christian will be resurrected to join that soul and spirit. We'll be resurrected just like He was resurrected. We'll live with Him forever in a new earth with redeemed, fully redeemed body and soul together with the Lord forever and ever and ever. Fullness of life, abundance of life. That is the gospel hope, eternal life in Jesus Christ. Well, I said at the beginning that John's letter is about certainty. Certainty, being certain about the biggest, most important things. And from these first verses, he wants us to be certain, first of all, of these great truths here regarding Jesus, regarding the gospel of our salvation. Because this is the starting point. This is the foundation of everything else in this letter. Everything else we have to study is all tied back to whether you believe the gospel, whether you believe in this Jesus, whether you believe in the apostolic witness of what John and Peter and the others saw and heard and touched of Jesus Christ. And so that's the question I'll leave you with today. Are you certain? Are you certain about the Christ of history? Are you certain about the Christ of the apostles? Are you certain about the Christ of the Bible? Are you certain of these things? If not, why not? Why won't you just believe the testimony of John and Peter and Paul and the rest? You must settle that first. There is life, abundant life, eternal life at stake here. And whether we believe whether we embrace this good news of Jesus Christ. We heard earlier this morning that He receives sinners. He, he receives those that come to Him. If you come in repentance and faith, if you come trusting in Him as your Lord, your Savior, if you come believing these truths, and so nothing else in the world is more important than these things. Being certain about the Lord Jesus Christ and His Gospel. I hope you can all say, yes, I'm certain about that. Yes, I'm convinced. Absolutely, I know whom I've believed. I know where I stand on this. There's a, there's a bunch of things I've got questions about, but I've got no question about the Lord Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior the one, the one who came, took on human flesh, lived a perfectly holy life, laid down that life as a sacrifice on the cross to bear our sins and, and suffer in our place, to be resurrected, to ascend back into heaven, to ever live as our high priest in glory. I'm certain about Jesus. Absolutely certain. I hope that's true of you. Amen.